Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Leong, and it's my pleasure to invite our speaker today, Dr. Trevor Bonada. Um, this is kind of a biology IBS combined visit to campus. So we're really grateful. We really put him to work. Um, he did a, a workshop, a professional development workshop for IBS CHEM and WRS graduate students this afternoon. And then now he's going to give us our, our seminar for today. So we're really excited about that. That's our inaugural uh, workshop after the pandemic. So we're really excited to get that started. And you were like a perfect person to do that. Um, so Trevor has got his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. And then he actually came here um, in the integrated biosciences pro program to get his master's degree, which he did with Ron Mullen. So Ron, actually, if you were a regular seminar attendant, kind of foreshadowed a little bit of this talk today. And then he did his PhD at Purdue University. And now he is a postdoc at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, working with Kim Vanderwall. Um, I just want to say, um, especially interesting, he's one of these people who combines his basic research and works really hard to make it accessible to undergraduate students. And so I don't know if you're going to be able to talk about that today. Yes, <laughs> a little bit. So um, I'll let you share that. But if you I'm trying to think of a question at the end, that might be a good <laughs> thing to circle back to. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks to the uh, IBS program and uh, Dr. Zimmer for inviting me here to uh, talk with you folks about some of my research. Um, if you have any questions or any interest in this type of stuff, feel free to email me. My U of M email is there, and then if you're, if you're big on science Twitter or nerdy like me and you want to come look, you can follow me on Twitter and you'll see random posts about who knows what, uh, snail pea and other things that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so today I'm going to be discussing uh, what I call a big picture view of disease. So looking at hosts, host animals in ecosystems, as well as conceptualizing a host itself as an ecosystem. And the, and the, um, the uh, concepts that can help us better understand the biology of disease. Oops, I clicked off here. So I wanted to start things off with an acknowledgments. Um, you can email me about this picture as well if you're interested. Um, snails in Renaissance marginal art is really interesting. Um, anyway, so uh, I wanted to thank my uh, PhD lab uh, and many of the undergraduate students who made this work possible, Bailey Pyle, Emily, Hannah, um, and these two students here we are going to be talking about um, two of their research projects today uh, and how and what they discovered about um, community ecology and disease, disease dynamics, as well as my uh, current lab, the Vanderwall Lab, <clears throat> for helping to, uh, to get some of my new information integrated into this talk. So I'm going to do a brief outline here for you. We're going to start things off by looking at how parasites uh, can alter host stoichiometry and physiology. And then we're going to move into whether these interactions can scale up to the ecosystem level, looking at how parasites influence ecosystem processes in these semi-natural mesocosm experiments. Then we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit, and we're going to move into how parasites might select host organisms, <clears throat> similar to how free living species select habitats. Then we're going to think about the host as an ecosystem and how the community within a host can potentially impact parasite development and reproduction. And then finally, we are going to look at a system in which pathogens evolve within an entire host ecosystem and spend almost their entire existence within a host as if it was an island. So in the world of disease ecology, there's something called the disease triangle. And that's what we're looking at here. So on the top, we have the ecosystem or the environment. We have the host and we have the parasite. And so what this was used to conceptualize was that these are the three things that we wanna consider when a disease is gonna become epidemic. 
or whether a disease can persist within an environment. It needs all three of these factors. And we've spent a lot of time thinking about how ecosystems impact free living organisms, how ecosystems or the environment can impact a parasite via temperature or something else, and how hosts and parasites kind of have this mutual exchange with one another through their immune systems and um, other mechanisms. But we've spent dramatically less time thinking about how hosts and parasites can potentially feed back on the ecosystem and modulate their environment in order to, to suit their needs uh, and potentially to generate feedbacks on the hosts and the disease itself. And so when we wanted to begin conceptualizing this idea, we turned to something called consumer-driven nutrient recycling. And so what this concept is, is the idea that hosts or that animals can transform nutrients, they can transfer nutrients, and they can do something called bioturbation. So what transformation is, is like this moose here, um, where it can browse on Douglas fir tips or whatever, um, and it transforms that Douglas fir, that plant material, into its own biomass. And so that changes how available those nutrients are, as different as a pine needle is from muscle tissue. And it can change and make it accessible to different organisms. Then there's this idea of nutrient transfer, which is like our uh, grizzly bear here, which can take salmon from a stream and can transfer it into a riparian habitat. And that can fertilize the forest and make more nutritious foliage in those riparian habitats. And so those nutrients can move from the stream into the forest. And then bioturbation, which we're not going to concern ourselves too much with today, is the idea that organisms, just by moving through their environment, can change the distribution of nutrients. Such as these salmon swimming through the stream, they can churn up the stream bottom. Like when you walk through mucky, a mucky pond, you can resuspend those nutrients, and it can become accessible to other organisms. But one thing that we've learned about parasites is that all of these organisms get their own parasites, giant liver flukes and moose, ticks and moose and bears and nematode worms like Anasacus and the salmon. And parasites can change all of these processes. They can change how efficient the assimilation of a host is. They can change its movement patterns to impact where it's dispersing nutrients. And those movement patterns can also potentially impact bioturbation. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at was this idea of host parasite stoichiometry and nutrient recycling. And so in this figure here, we have an uninfected snail up on top and we have an infected snail on the bottom. And so one thing that we're beginning to understand about some parasites is that they can be really rich in phosphorus. And so they become this massive phosphorus sink to a host. So if you feed an uninfected snail and an infected snail on the same nutrient, they're going to release waste at different ratios than, than the other class of hosts. And so what we know is that it's not only the rate at which a nutrient comes into a system, but it can also be the ratio at which it comes in that can impact primary production and have cascading impacts in the systems. And parasites are potentially changing these stoichiometric relationships. And so that was one thing that we wanted to really explore. And this is just the beginning. We only have a few examples of these. And so we wanted to see if well, there's any generalizable patterns here. Can we take a different host parasite system and see similar results? And so we used a parasite called Echinostoma trivolvus. We're not going to worry too much about the name right now, but it has this really awesome complex life cycle. So it starts its life in the intestines of muskrats and waterfowl. It's released as an egg. That egg hatches and infects one snail. And then that uh, parasite undergoes asexual reproduction, releases parasites into the water, which go and infect a second snail. And then when that snail is eaten, it begins the life cycle all over again. And so these are these really, there's really exciting complex life cycles that we can talk more about if you'd be interested. So we went out, we field collected a bunch of snails, um, we screened them for parasitic infection and then isolated them after the fact. And then we fed them for two weeks on this standardized diet of snail jello, <laughs> as much as they could eat. And then we matched them um, for size and mass so that we could kind of control for metabolic differences between um, different sized and different aged individuals. 
To do these excretion trials, what you do is you take some well water or water of known carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus concentration that you measure before and afterward, and then you put the snail into a chamber and you let it live its life for three to four hours, releasing poo and pee into the water um, so that you can come back and measure it. Then you filter those samples in order to get the dissolved constituents, and then you measure for what you're looking for. In our case, uh, dissolved organic carbon, uh, ammonium, and phosphates. <clears throat> then we moved these animals to a foraging arena, and we gave them again more snail jello um, that had a known mass. We dried it um, and got a known mass. We allowed the snail to live in there for 24 hours, and then we came back and we collected everything. We crushed the snail, dried its mass so that we could measure carbon nitrogen, um, as well as the amount of dry food to calculate how much that snail had eaten. And then we removed their fecal strings as well. Snails release fecal strings um, is what we term them. And these were dried and weighed. And then you light them on fire in, a, in an elemental analyzer, a CNH elemental analyzer. So the point of doing all this was to calculate um, something what uh, a somewhat adjusted type of assimilation efficiency. And so what that is, is that you have ingestion. We wanted to treat the snail as if it was sort of its own ecosystem with inputs and outputs coming in. And so we had our, the ingestion, which is our snail jello comes in, and then we needed to measure how much egestion or feces came out, how much excretion came out in the form of liquid waste, as well as we wanted to include how much was coming out in the form of reproductive material into the environment. So in an infected snail, that comes out as parasite propagules. In an uninfected snail, it comes out as um, host egg masses. These parasites castrate the host um, when they infect them. And so what we can do with that is essentially calculate a percentage, which is what percent of the nutrient that comes in is being turned into biomass and what's being released as waste. So we did this for both carbon and nitrogen. In the interest of time, I'm going to show you nitrogen because it has the most interesting story. <laughs> So down on the bottom here, we have our uninfected snail. It's intaking about eight milligrams per gram of snail tissue per day. And then it's releasing nitrogen in these amounts uh, each day. So four milligrams per gram of snail per day in the form of fecal strings, two and a half in the form of excretion, and then this really small amount in terms of reproductive material. Now, when we look at an infected snail, we get a somewhat horrifying picture if you are a host. So if you look on the bottom, I skipped over this for a second. This is our assimilation efficiency as we calculate. So uninfected snails are assimilating some nitrogen. They're getting about 15% of the nitrogen that they're ingesting, which is um, within the range of what you'd expect from theoretical predictions. But when we compare this to an infected snail, these infected snails have a negative nitrogen budget. Every single day, they are essentially releasing nitrogen in one form or another into the environment. And so they're more or less wasting away in a sense. And so what you can see is the main differences here come in the form of excretion, excreted nitrogen, as well as nitrogen that's coming out as a parasite reproductive material. And so what we think is happening here is that the parasite is really good at soaking up sugars from the snail hemolymph. And so that leaves all those local habitats within the snail are starved for energy. And the easiest form of energy after the sugars is protein catabolism. And so what's likely happening is as the parasites soak up the sugar, the snail has to take, it has to, dissolve proteins and release nitrogen as a byproduct of that in order to attempt to maintain its nitrogen balance. And so it's still not doing a great job because it's not positive, but presumably that's what's occurring within these snails. And when we combine this with our, with our carbon data, we can see that the stoichiometry of this relationship is mixed up as well. So on our y-axis here, we have the carbon to nitrogen ratio of excretions um, in our infected and uninfected snails have a significant difference between these two. In this case, a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio means more nitrogen is being released and less carbon is being released. And that's largely driven by that excretion that we're seeing. 
<clears throat> so we know from, um, from studies that have been coming out um, and from just general ecological stoichiometry that altered stoichiometry and altered nutrient rates can potentially have cascading impacts on ecosystems. So this is one potential mechanism by which parasites might be having um, kind of these subtle impacts on ecosystems that we haven't thought about before. But parasites can have other influences on ecosystems as well. And these are kind of broken down into three major categories. One of which is that parasites can uh, impact the animal's traits. So traits are anything, anything that's related to like behavior and physiology. So how an animal's moving around, its stoichiometry is a trait. Um, and so just by existing within the environment, parasites can alter the traits the behavior and the physiology of their hosts. And this, much like predators do, this can have cascading impacts on ecosystems as animals change how they behave, where they spend their time, um, how large their group sizes are. These can all potentially have cascading influences. But parasites can also impact the density of their hosts. And this is where we spend most of our time thinking about this, is that if parasites reduce the density of their hosts, that's going to reduce the impact of those hosts within the environment. And this is where an idea called trophic cascades comes into play, where in the Yellowstone system, when wolves depredate on elk, that, um, that can increase aspen recruitment because there's less elk to, to kind of push down those consumers or those uh, producers. And in parasite systems, we see a similar thing, where by castrating hosts and by killing hosts, this reduces density of those hosts and that can have cascading impacts to lower food levels or to lower trophic levels. There's also something called the direct impact of parasites. And this one's pretty straightforward or direct. It's that parasites just have a lot of biomass. They just represent a lot of biomass within ecosystems. And so here, trematodes are outlined. These are our parasites down here and on the, or our different group of organisms. Um, these are in Northern California montane streams. And here we have biomass density on the y-axis. So we have trematodes representing, trematode parasites, representing as much biomass as crayfish and salamanders within ecosystems. But it's a biomass that we've historically kind of just ignored, like, oh, it's a trematode. It lives inside something, let's not worry about it. But clearly there's a huge amount of biomass here that we haven't been accounting for. And things eat trematodes through carrier, they're ingesting them when they eat other hosts. And so there could be a potential relationship here. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was see if our stoichiometry, see if some of these behavioral characteristics that we documented um, and see if all these other things can potentially actually scale up. We measured that stoichiometry changed, we measured some changes in behavior, but does it matter? Is the effect size large enough? And so in order to do that, we wanted to build some mesocosms. And so we wanted to ask the questions, can parasites actually alter ecosystem processes at a scale that matters? Are they gonna have any influence on these primary producers in these systems? And can we separate out the impact of parasites? Can we tell whether it's a density mediated impact, a trait mediated thing, or a direct impact of parasitism? And so we turned back to the Echinostoma trivulvus system again, um, what we want to focus on is the shaded area. So we replicated this transmission pathway in our mesocosms, where we have one snail that's infected, it's going to release parasites into the environment, and they're going to infect a second snail. So this is what we wanted to replicate. And one main reason that we chose this is that it's been historically thought that these parasites here, as they infect that second snail, have very little impact on host mortality. And so we were hoping that this was gonna kind of control for these density mediated impact, impacts because everything we had seen in the literature was suggesting that they should have very minuscule impacts on mortality. So we created our ecosystems. And the first thing we had to do is create a gradient in parasitism. So we had a low, a moderate and a high parasitism treatment, um, which is where zero snails, zero first or source snails were infected. These were the snails that were gonna release parasites into the mesocosm that would infect the second snail. 
And then in our moderate treatment, we had two of these infected, two of them releasing parasites. And in our high parasite treatment, all five of those snails were going to be releasing parasites into the environment um, and infecting our hosts. So then we had to make our, our ecosystems. And so our mesocosms were built like this. We had these 150 liter uh, tubs. We put a cinder block in there for some habitat structure and to potentially provide some calcium for shell growth. <clears throat> We had uh, added our ecosystem starter kit, as I like to call it, which was filtered, filtered and homogenized sediment um, to establish bacterial communities and algal communities and get our ecosystems running. We then put these uh, ceramic tiles in the bottom um, to have a standardized unit for measuring algae, or paraphyton is a word you'll see used, which is the algae that grows on surfaces. <clears throat> we, filled the, uh, we filled the tank with water. Uh, and then we added our, our um, snails to the system. Our uninfected, these snails were raised in the laboratory for a year, so we knew they were parasite free, added them to the mesocosm, um, and then let them adjust for a few weeks to begin reproducing and to acclimate to the treatment. During this time, surface vegetation grew, and then we added our treatment snails. We caged them within these, um, these PVC and bolt cloth cages, which were large enough to let the parasites swim out, but small enough to keep our snails contained within. And then we let them do their business. And we let the parasites come out of the snails, swim through the water, and infect the, um, the free roaming snails. And then we measured the crap out of these things. We measured a lot of things that I'm not going to show you. Um, we measured infection intensity as well as snail density measured dissolved nutrients, we measured paraphyton um, ash-free dry mass, which is a measure um, paraphyton quality and how much, um, how much nutrient is in there, um, as well as uh, the surface vegetation biomass. We measured community structure and prevalence and a bunch of other things as well, but we're not going to worry too much about those today. <clears throat> so this, don't worry too much about each of these individual figures. This is up here to show you that our treatments worked. Across the gradient of cage snail or source snail prevalence, we saw increases in, um, in prevalence in the free living snails. We saw increases in the mean intensity of infection across the snails. Um, and in order to do this, we ended up crushing. So in order to find the parasites and confirm infection, you have to crush the snails. Uh, we crushed over 1,200 snails and we counted over 19,000 parasites. Um, I was seeing parasites in my sleep for a long, long time, or just when I closed my eyes, really. Um, so it was, it was all worth it because it worked. <laughs> so let's look at some of the results from this. Um, the first thing that we saw is that prior or contrary to what we were seeing in the literature, there was an impact of infection on snail abundance. Our, impact, our effect size here is quite small, right? The slopes of these lines is very low, but there is still a significant relationship between these. The slope of these lines is not zero, even though our effect size is low. So we can't totally say that our treatments did not impact snail density. There were some impacts of snail density that were happening here, but hopefully the system that we chose helped us to minimize those to a certain degree. The next thing that we saw was that infection influenced some of our producer biomass. So as we look at prevalence in those free living snails, as prevalence increased, the percent of that paraphyton or that algae that, was at, that had ash-free dry mass increased significantly. So again, our effect size is a little shallow here, but we're seeing that as infection, as prevalence is increasing, the ash-free dry mass, the nutritive quality of their algae is also increasing as well. <clears throat> the other thing that we saw was that as mean infection intensity increased, the total amount of algae was also significantly increasing. So higher infection intensities meant more algae within our mesocosms. So this is all well and good, but there's a lot of things that are going on, right? And it's difficult to separate out these ideas of density. We changed the host density a little bit. We definitely had impacts on the infection in the snails, 
Um, but how do we separate out the, these trait density and direct impacts? And so logistically, it's difficult, but statistically, there's something called structural equation models, um, which can help us to figure out these different paths. This is also called a path analysis. And so the numbers associated with each of the arrows here, you can consider to be a strength of the interaction. Really high positive values mean that there was a positive influence between the two things. And really large negative values mean that there was a negative influence between those two things. So when we break these down, we can think about this as being host density, the impact of host density on paraphyte and dry mass, the impact of infection intensity, and then the, imp the direct impact of our treatments. So here we have a density impact, here we have trait mediated impacts, and here we have direct impacts. And when we compare these different values, what this suggests is that our trait mediated impacts have a stronger influence on our paraphyte and dry mass than these other two categories. And so this to us suggested, although it's preliminary, our sample sizes are small. We had 24 mesocosms, which in mesocosm world is a lot of work, but in statistics land, it's like you want more further support for this. Um, this is suggesting to us that our trait mediated impacts might be having a fairly marked impact compared to the density mediated impacts, which we've documented in the past. So some of the possible drivers for these changes in paraphyte and biomass can dial down to um, behavior and physiology as well. So I won't be talking about this today, but if you're interested, I can share you show you some really cool videos of uh, shaking snails. Um, when snails are attacked by parasites, they shake their shells. And this can jar loose algae and kind of break it off of the walls and allow it to settle at the bottom of the tank. Uh, they also, snails will reduce um, how much they forage during parasite attack. So if you're constantly being attacked by parasites, you tend to eat less. This allows the paraphyte to accumulate. And also parasites lower the abundance of the hosts. We can't disregard that that was still occurring and that it's still having an impact on those ecosystems. So we saw that parasites had some impacts in ecosystems, but if we flip this relationship on its head, can we use the ecosystem concept to inform disease ecology at smaller scales? Can we treat a host as an ecosystem and have that teach us anything about how disease works. And so this is marking a transition in our talk today. We've covered these two things, and I'm going to briefly discuss these uh, three projects here, um, not in as great of depth as the previous ones. So the first thing we want to start out thinking about is that free living species, like our deer and our moose and all the charismatic things that we like to think about, they choose foraging patches and they choose home ranges. Um, and they choose the habitats in which they live, oftentimes. Parasites face a similar challenge. But when you're a parasite, you've got a lifelong commitment for the most part. When you choose that host, you're stuck there and that's where you're gonna be living the rest of your life. Um, so it's a, it's a challenging real estate market. So these parasites have developed, um, uh, evolved complicated ways uh, to see, or complicated yet simple at the same time, of seeking out and finding hosts by using um, geotactic cues, phototactic cues, as well as chemo, um, chemotactic cues to dial in on the snails that they, or the other hosts that they would like to infect. And when they're doing this, when they're searching for a host, they're at the whim of mortality. They only have eight to 24 hours to find a host oftentimes. There's chance involved. Are you gonna encounter a predator? Are you gonna hit a stream of water that pulls you in a different direction than you wanna go? But for today, what I want us to think about is this idea of some what's called interspecific antagonism. And this is that when a parasite is looking for a host, somebody might already be there by the time that that parasite's coming to look. And in the world of parasites, there's this really interesting concept called dominance hierarchies. And that's where certain parasites are competitively dominant over other parasites. And some parasites have gone as far as to evolve and adapt to these specific divisions of labor. This is a reproductive redia here, which makes parasite propagules and releases them into the environment. 
This is the same species of parasite, but this is a soldier. And it's evolved to wander around in the snail's gonad and look for competitors. And if it finds them, it latches on and it breaks them apart. And so that's what we were curious about. When you're a parasite looking for a host, do you know what you're getting into when you're selecting a host? And so this is one of the undergraduate projects that we wanted to talk about today. We wanted to explore this. Can parasites detect the infection status of their hosts before they invade? And are they able to, to use these stimuli to respond to that and select a potential host that's gonna be more favorable? So in order to do this, our lab um, maintained two competitively distinct parasites. We have this really important human parasite called Chistosoma mansoni, um, which infects about 220 million people worldwide um, and causes about 200,000 deaths a year. The echinostome parasite, if they infect the same snail, the echinostome will eat the schistosome and eradicate it. In the 1980s, they were pretty excited about this. They're like, let's go dump a bunch of echinostomes into lakes and see if it can eliminate the schistosomes, but it never worked. And so we are gonna suggest that the experiment that we're running right now is potentially part of the reason that that experiment in the 80s failed. So we wanted to see if those parasites could really make choices or really respond to these stimuli. So we have these two-way choice chambers um, also known as wedding invitation boxes. <laughs> it was really, it turns out that they don't manufacture parasite choice chambers. So we had to get creative. Um, and so what we did was we had these little plastic tubes. Um, we put a snail of different infection status in each side um, and we isolated them on those sides, let them wander around and get it all chemically queued up with snail, um, with snail slime. We removed the snails so the parasites couldn't get inside. And then we added our parasites to the chamber and let them swim around. Let them make a choice about which stimulus that they find uh, most reactive. And then after a few minutes, after about 10 or 15 minutes, we put a divider in there to isolate them on each side so that we can count and see which side the parasites most preferred. So to do this, we did a full factorial design. We won't worry too much about this. We had positive controls and negative controls to see if the parasites just preferred a certain side of the chamber um, to see if they could detect the presence of a snail at all. And then to see which of these types of snails they preferred to infect. So we did it with both parasites, schistosoma, what are called Miracidia, or the parasite that's looking for a host, um, and then echinostoma, and we gave them both the same choices. And we made predictions that we won't worry too much about the details of at this particular moment. The first thing that we saw is great. Schistosomes, the parasites, are able to detect the presence of a snail. Good. <laughs> our, our wedding invitation boxes are successful. <clears throat> and then when we began to explore this further, we started to see really interesting things um, that supported our initial prediction. First of all, that schistosoma, the wimpy parasite that gets eaten, avoids the bully. It moves away from the parasite that can eat it. It would rather go to an uninfected snail than to a snail filled with a competitor. Great, makes sense. We also found that in, when presented with two infected snails, the parasite will choose um, the, uh, the same species of parasite. So schistosomes would rather infect a schistosome infected snail than any kind of stone infected snail, which is good because one of them will eat you. What was especially interesting is when we gave the schistosomes a choice between an infected snail and an uninfected snail of the same species, they didn't care. They were willing to go both either way to either snail. And this is where knowing something about the biology of this parasite is really helpful. Schistosomes are dioecious one of the few parasites that has distinct male-female sexes. And so what we thought was there might be a trade-off here. If you go to a snail that's infected with a schistosome, well, you might be able to find a reproductive partner and get into the same host, mate, and outcross. That's good news. If you go to an uninfected snail, you're getting a totally unexploited resource. 
So maybe that allows you to persist in the environment for longer. And so it was really interesting to see these, uh, these interactions play out in a nice clean way, which does not often happen in ecology. And so some conclusions we were able to draw from this, we can discuss the other half of that experiment if you're interested. Um, is that some parasites that are able to detect the infection status of potential hosts. And those schistosomes, those weaker competitors, are under fairly strong selection to avoid getting eaten, basically, um, which is a good thing to avoid. But what if you're a schistosome and you infect a snail first and the echinostome comes afterwards? That was what we wanted to explore in the next experiment. Um, this was a project that was run by uh, Sarah Carpenter, my undergraduate, that was just published in International Journal of Parasitology a few months ago. And we wanted to look at whether co-infections could alter disease progression. And so what we did was we staggered parasite exposure. So on the bottom, the bottom arrow shows when we exposed these snails to schistosomes, to the weak competitor. And then on the top is when we exposed them to the pinosomes, the strong, um, the strong competitor. And we wanted to see whether changing the order and the timing of parasite arrival could impact how these parasites developed and reproduced. So we had a simultaneous co-exposure. We both parasites show up at exactly the same time. We had a one week delay, a four week delay, and then a six week delay between these parasite exposures. And what we saw here was that on the y axis, or sorry, on the x axis here, is how many weeks after a snail was exposed to echinosomes, to the dominant parasite, and then how likely it was to shed or to release parasite propagules into the environment. And so when echinosomes showed up by themselves, when the dominant competitor showed up alone, by about five weeks, all the snails are releasing parasites. But when we delay these, arrivals, or even when we do a co-exposure, it gets later and later and later. Those echinostomes are having to work. They're trying to, they have to eliminate the existing infection before they can fully take over and begin reproducing. So that was our impact on development time. This is what's called a, a priority effect, where in a community, if somebody shows up first, it alters the environment um, for the, whoever shows up later. But what about their reproduction? So again, on our x-axis are our different treatment groups down here, and then the number of parasites that they're releasing. So when echinostomes are show up completely alone, when the dominant parasite is by itself, it releases about 60, 70 circaria um, in an hour and a half. But with each of these co-exposures, when a snail is exposed to both parasites, more of the dominant competitor is released. So although being co-infected, having both parasites delayed when the dominant competitor would release its offspring, they were releasing more offspring after that time. And so there are some potential things that are happening Either the immune system of that snail is compromised and it allows the dominant competitor to just ramp up its reproduction. Uh, the dominant competitor, when it's eating those schistosomes, it could be nutritious and that helps them put out more parasite propagules as well. <clears throat> and so there are a number of things that could be happening there. Um, and we could explore it more, <laughs> more in depth. We didn't do the opposite side of this experiment where echinostomes are first and schistosomes come second because the echinostomes have just eaten them. So we decided to save ourselves a few hundred snails um, and uh, skip on that experiment at this time. So can viewing, can viewing our host as an ecosystem grant us perspective in these other systems? So we're thinking about trematodes, which sort of interact intimately with the environment. They have two stages where they have to move through an aquatic environment and seek a host. But what about for an organism where the host is its entire ecosystem? For things like bacteria and viruses, especially viruses where they normally spend a transient amount of time moving through the environment. And so this is our current work now 
is kind of looking at this relationship with viruses. And so um, at the U of M Twin Cities, we're studying what's called foot and mouth disease. Um, it is related to hand, foot and mouth disease, but foot and mouth disease infects um, cattle and ungulates um, and the other um, typically large, uh, large livestock, economically important animals. Um, and it can be incredibly economically costly. Um, so amongst the, uh, the diseases that are of an economic threat to the globe and livestock, foot and mouth disease continuously rates amongst the highest, where a single outbreak in the UK in 2007 uh, cost about $13 billion um, to manage and to control and with all the trade restrictions. Um, so this is a potentially very economically important disease. <clears throat> Uh, so a little background on the virus. We're all becoming intimately aware of RNA viruses these days. Um, it's a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus. Um, the whole genome, the full viral genome, is about 8,000 base pairs. Um, as I was telling people earlier, I'm spoiled when I tell people, yeah, I work on the whole genome sequencing. <laughs> um, and it's uh, one continuous reading frame, which is interesting. So there's one start codon that translates all of these proteins and then the proteases come in and cleave it and build it into, into um, what it needs to be in order to continue its uh, existence. So right in here, I'm gonna draw your attention to these capsid proteins and specifically this one called VP1. VP1 is sort of like the spike protein of FMD. This is what helps the viral capsid to lock onto the cell and enter into the cell and continue its replication. So a lot of sequencing work has been done with VP1. And all the stuff I'm going to talk about today is um, focused on VP1. So F and D has this really interesting biology. And the main question related to foot and mouth disease virus right now is the, is the impact of these carrier animals. So normal disease progression is that an animal gets infected. It goes through an early phase of infection where the virus is replicating and building up. And then it goes through this transitional phase where the immune system starts to catch up and it starts to eliminate that virus. In most animals, the virus gets cleared and you can no longer detect the virus by PCR and it seems to be gone. In some animals, they enter a persistent state of infection called a carrier state. And so in cattle, this can be up to two and a half years where they're producing detectable amounts of virus. In Asian buffalo, it can be two years. In an African buffalo, we can get five years of this persistently detectable virus within the nasopharynx. <clears throat> What's interesting here is we know very little about what these carriers are doing in an epidemiological sense. One study has documented that an African uh, buffalo was able to transmit as a carrier to another animal and infect it. But evidence is weak and we don't really have many good documented cases of this happening. But we're sort of at the whim of this law of large numbers. If something happens one in 100,000 times and you have 100 million animals across the globe or even you know, in certain areas, um, <clears throat> you could potentially have these somewhat rare occurrences happening frequently enough to be of relevance. And so we wanna know what's happening within these carrier animals, um, and is it epidemiologically significant? So the carrier animals, they put selective pressure on the viruses. Um, you wanna look at the teal color here. These are three samples taken from the same individual um, over three months. And so on this phylogenetic tree, you can see this nice stepwise progression where there's a few nucleotide changes, a few little mutations over a month, and then a few more mutations over the next month, a nice pretty picture of what you'd expect to see. But then on this unwieldy tree, we have these two, we have these two samples that are right next to each other in September and October, like you'd expect. But then all of a sudden there's this huge jump where this uh, sequence seems to make a huge leap um, to another entire branch of this phylogenetic tree. And so this is where like next generation sequencing um, and other things can help us figure out what's going on within these hosts. Um, so this is likely a process such as population dynamics, where one virus, you detect a lot of one virus, but then over the next month, a new one becomes more dominant 
and that's the one you're detecting. And so it looks like this huge evolutionary leap, but really it's just standard population dynamics. You can also have reinfection, um, which is where a different serotype or a different type of virus gets in, um, and it just looks very different. And in the world of viruses, you can also have recombination. So all of these, the call or the rows here are different individuals and each of the cells is a sampling event. Um, these yellow squares represent where we saw a larger leap than we would expect from just kind of constant steady mutation over time. <clears throat> and so we really wanna dig into this further. Our next steps are to use next generation sequencing to really dial in and look at the different variants that are present within a, ho a host, as well as analyzing those full length sequences and doing something called a breakpoint and recombination analysis, which is where we traditionally have this image of the tree of life as these nice distinct branches, but in reality, DNA is flying all over and it's a huge mess. <laughs> and we're just starting to get statistical techniques and methodologies that can really help us dial in on when these recombinations occur and where they occur from. And so uh, with that, we've toured a lot of different things. Uh, I just wanted to put up the outline. So if you have a question about something specific, it's a reminder for you about <laughs> the number of things I've talked about. And I would be happy to uh, take any questions you might have. Okay, so I'm actually going to um, introduce Sarah Zimmer. She's the associate DGS for the Integrated Biosciences Program, and she initiated the idea of bringing Dr. Van out of here. And she's actually an infectious disease biologist, <laughs> so we're going to have her run the question period. So thank you, Sarah. Wonderful, thank you. I can give you a minute of the backstory here. Um, I went. Uh, we my lab attended a meeting, um, Midwestern Conference of Parasitologists, and we um, study things at the very molecular level and we're in a medical school and we show up at this meeting and we see that everybody is totally into phylogenetic trees and we haven't met anybody before. So um, because there's nothing to lose, what are they gonna do, not talk to me? I looked for the table where people seem to know each other and they seem really happy and popular. And there was Trevor Venata and he, uh, you know, I introduced myself and said where I was from and he said, oh, do you do anything to do with the IBS program? Because I, I got my master's there. And so it was just kind of a fortuitous meeting. And um, I'm glad we did this because um, I love entertaining talks. And I like talks where, you know, the people that are interested in ecosystems got to see the ecosystems. And I got to see a couple individual nucleotides. So that makes our lab happy. So um, thank you for covering all bases. Um, and per tradition now, we would like our undergraduates uh, to be, have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and anybody can just uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, go ahead. All right, so I noticed in the slide with the um, hook and mouth disease, like India was pretty dark. Do you think that the length of persistence in those animals affects the um, like yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, India is partly dark because they have an enormous number of cattle. And so that leads to a large prevalence in that country. Um, and, you know, in, in India, often in many regions, cattle are considered sacred. And so they're not being slaughtered. They're mostly for breeding and dairy. And so there's a large number of long lived animals. And so in a sense of a carrier, you know, oftentimes these animals are only alive for in, in, in um, other nations where they might use beef as a food source. The animals are only raised from calf to adult and then killed for beef production. Um, and so there might be a relationship there between how long the animals are allowed to live and breed and whether or not they're able to stay in that carrier state. Um, so it could be partly the carrier state is more persistent. I would guess it has more to do with cattle, de cattle density than with a specific role of carriers in India. Okay, we have uh, time for a lot of other um, student questions, other undergraduate questions today. And thank you for that first one. That was very informative. 
We also have graduate students here today. Um, please ask your questions before you don't get a chance. Oh, sorry, undergrad or graduate. I don't know which one. We look the same. <laughs> So in those slides about when the infection got to chew between different snails, when the second infection came in, did it cost the that infection a lot more energy to kill off the first one? And then did that like double or overall the overall infection damage for the most part to the snail? Oh yeah. So I um I didn't include that uh in the original slide. Um, but I <laughs> I did I did include <laughs> I knew you were going to be here. I, I told him to show up and ask this question so I could pull out my extra slides and impress everyone. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, when the, when the second infection shows up, the mortality of the snail is largely dictated by the more deadly infection. And so that's what we're looking at here. So we have days post the first infection. This is the schistosome, the wimpy one. <laughs> and then we have days post echinostome infection, which is the bully parasite. And so here we're not seeing a ton that's going on. Like it sort of seems like days post schistosome infection isn't having a big impact. It's sort of all over the place as to when this is a survival analysis, sorry. And on the, on the x-axis is days post exposure. On the y-axis is survival probability. So as these go down, snails are dying. What we see is that on days post echinostome exposure, these almost all follow the same path. And so what that's telling us is mortality in infected snails is driven almost exclusively by the first or by the more deadly infection. This parasite tends to kill the snails really quickly. Um, and so when it shows up, it just kind of drives everything down. Okay, we can absolutely continue our question period. Yeah. Uh, big question. Uh, why do the snails shake their shells when they're <laughs> Yeah. Oh, do I have a video? I think I yes. do. <laughs> we'll see if it downloaded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So this was going to be to discuss. Um, let's see if it comes. Okay, it's moving a little bit. Oh, look at it Yep, so there's the snail shaking its shell. I put this video in here specifically because when it shakes its shell, and it might be hard to see in here, there's kind of, there's um, dissolved stuff coming off of the jello. This is that snail jello um, that's in there. Uh, and when the snail shakes its shell, it picks up some material from the bottom of the foraging chamber. Um, and so we thought this might be related to bioturbation. And so we were kind of excited about that, but we don't have any good data looking at how much bioturbation or if it introduces oxygen or what it's doing, um, just implications. But yeah, so when they shake their shell, we think, so it seems to be a general response to mechanosensory stimulation. So these snails, when they're attacked by leeches, they shake their shell. If you put them next to a bunch of other snails and they're all brush and shoulders, they'll shake their shell. And when you would send parasites to swim up inside of their shells, they'll shake their shell. What's really, and I was discussing this earlier with someone, what's really interesting to me is that shaking, that shell shaking attracts visual predators. They've done experiments where they put leeches and fish together and when those snails shake their shells, predators are like, well, there's a snail there. And then they go snatch it up. So now what we're thinking, we don't think this is related to parasites getting to their next host, which would have been really cool um, because when they shake their shell in response to parasites, uh, the parasites aren't ready to infect the next host. Um, so it wouldn't help. Um, but now we have this really interesting link between predators and parasites where parasites might be increasing the energy flow and the nutrient flow into the next trophic level um, by making their their hosts more visible. So, now, have yeah. they confirmed that by doing, say, uh, I don't know, by a mechanical vibration or something to get it to make it? Yep. Okay, so in, in one of the experiments with the leeches, they only used leech chemical cues mm -hmm. to induce the shaking. 
um, and still the visual predators were able to pick up on it. So. Okay, um, uh, go ahead, please. Um, when you were looking at your uh, elements going on to some carbon and nitrogen process, yeah. did you by chance look at uh, nitrogen things such as iron? Uh, we did not look at iron or any of those. So we primarily focused in on carbon and nitrogen um, and a little bit of phosphorus uh, for two reasons. Carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus are the bread and butter of stoichiometry folks. Not to say that other nutrients aren't very important, but right now we're at like stage one of understanding how parasites impact stoichiometry. So keeping it within a framework for good comparison to other systems is important at this point. Um, the other reason, and maybe the overly honest methods reason, <laughs> is that carbon and nitrogen are really easy to analyze. Um, and that's also why for solid samples, we only measured carbon and nitrogen because you just need, you need more dry material to measure your phosphorus because you have to dissolve it in acid and then, and then do a bunch of stuff with it um, in order to see it. And we just didn't have, we didn't have enough snail poo to like really <laughs> dive into the phosphorus. Um, and oftentimes we looked at the snail's gonads and the snail gonads really small and there's just not enough material to get carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus from a single individual. And so that's why we focused on, on those. Anybody else want to ask a question for which you'll get a completely honest answer? <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. Oh, yeah. Could you go to your uh, the slides in the second string, the mesocosmic slides? Yeah. Anyone in particular? Uh, the first. The slides are the same threats that you have in your food ones. Oh, the ground. Oh, okay. Where you have snail infection and da da da. Are you looking at this? Yeah. All right. So, what's cool about this, I kept mentioning this this morning in breakfast, but here you have the first link in a think of a, you know, a top down control. Yeah. And your first link is positive and strong. Okay. So, the more uh, handsome you have, the more snails are infected. So that mm -hmm. makes sense. But it's very strong. And there's there, there's a yeah. nice slope and there's there's some scatter, but not much. So now go to the next one. So now the more the snails are infected, um, snail abundance goes down, but it's weaker. Yeah. Okay, so it's going in the right direction, but it's weaker. You go to the next one. Same deal. Yeah, the more the snails are infected, algae goes up, but it's even weaker yet. And in your paper, the next step, which would be nutrients in the water, there's no effect. So what's happening as you go down from the top down control is the effects are alternating in the right way, but they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Sure. And this has been suggested theoretically by a couple of people. It's not something that experimental people focus on that much. Hmm. And this is a real the reason why I'm saying this is that this is a really nice experiment that actually demonstrates that. But people are thinking about predators go down, like Steve Carpenter, Tom Brock, he got yeah. the late trial out there. This shows the same thing as happening with parasites. Yeah. So it's, it's, I like this. I think there might have been. A paper that just came out. It was like um, weak interactions with of strong interactors or something. Yeah. With like Oswald Schmitz, um, who oh, also yeah, does a lot of trophic cascade stuff. So, so I wonder if that's the cool thing is is that this is what makes ecosystem stable. Because if you have strong strong top down control, you can have nice things going down. Models that do that are very unstable. Yeah. So it's the weakening. It's not just the top down control, it's the weakening of the top down control as you go further and further away from whatever sure. is on top. That's probably responsible for stability. Or yeah. at least one of them is responsible for stability in the business. So Interesting. this is really nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be good to do some theoretical explorations of that, which I I, I would like to show you guys some equations, but maybe next time <laughs> we can go through some of the differential equations. Okay, uh, so the equations got mentioned, so we're done. <laughs> 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 Just kidding for all the modelers. Um, we need you very badly. 
in science. <laughs> no question about it. But I just noticed that it is past four o'clock now. So I don't want to keep everybody, uh, anybody waiting for me to move on. But um, I'm sure Carol will be here for additional conversation for those of you that have additional questions. Uh, I know I have a number of them. Thank you very much.